Thank you. There's no music or dancing, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you've been paying much attention at all to the news, especially over the last couple of years, uh, it's likely that you have a, a pretty dim view of the internet and of social media, especially. Whether it's a Russian hacking or uh, predatory advertising, uh, unauthorized data collection, hoaxes, fake news, harassment, FOMO, uh, depression in teens, uh, the fire Festival. Uh, the list of issues caused or at least exacerbated by social media is uh, substantial. And at this point, I wouldn't really blame anyone if they were thinking about uh, just giving up on it entirely, uh, deleting all their accounts, unplugging and disconnecting. Uh, in fact, that's what all of these articles written by very serious media professionals uh, seem to recommend. Well, it looks pretty bad, right? I know that I personally came very close to losing my mind during the 2016 election cycle from being entirely too online. And even though I do still use them uh, on a daily basis, I can't say that I really recommend that anybody ever actually open Twitter or Facebook or Instagram if they value their mental or emotional health. <laughs> I do want to push back, though, on what appears to be uh, an emerging professional consensus. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that social media is good for you. It almost certainly is not. Uh, that it's, or that it isn't dangerous and scary to have our brains hooked up to a constant stream of alarmism and negativity. Or that you shouldn't be concerned about what Google and Facebook and the NSA are doing with your private data. Or that it isn't worrisome uh, that we've left control of what is essentially the new public square in the hands of a small number of unaccountable organizations with shadowy algorithms and uh, profit models that rely on driving uh, your eyeballs and clicks to their content and keeping you constantly swiping and engaging and reading and scrolling until your brain has turned to mush and nothing really makes sense anymore and the only thing that can make you laugh are deeply weird uh, internet jokes like this one. <laughs> but I would like to offer a little bit of perspective by uh, showing you a headline about a, a different sort of disruptive technology. Yes, I'm talking, of course, about the printing press tonight. Um, as it turns out, a dangerous and disruptive, uh, unprecedented technology that threatens to overturn our hard-earned stability is not a problem that is unique to the 21st century. Uh, sure, uh, Cambridge Analytica and Gamergate are bad, but Twitter has yet to cause a major religious schism or uh, spark a war that consumes the entire continent. Um, there is still time, but so far, uh, the body count is comparatively low. I'm a historian, and so I can't help but try to draw lessons from the past, even though it is very rarely as simple as just following a formula. And uh, even though they are you know, unique to the 21st century, um, your smartphone and all of the apps contained therein are, are just tools. Um, very powerful tools, to be sure, and ones that our monkey brains may not be particularly well equipped to deal with, but tools nonetheless. And if somebody smashes all of your windows with a hammer, uh, the fault doesn't lie with the hammer. Um, let's step back a bit and talk a little bit about that previous period of disruption. Uh, there was a time when a key fact that uh, every school child had to memorize was the inventor of the printing press. Does anybody know? Anybody know? Excellent, that's right. Johann Gutenberg, a goldsmith and inventor living in Mainz, Germany uh, in the 15th century, is usually credited with inventing the printing press so sometime around 1453. Uh, though it's actually good that uh, children no longer have to memorize this fact because it's wrong. Uh, Gutenberg didn't invent anything. Uh, movable type had been in use in China since the Song Dynasty. And two, memorizing facts is a terrible way to learn about history. <laughs> Don't feel bad, I tricked you. Um, <laughs> It is, however, useful to think about this moment as a, a tremendous shift in the ability of uh, knowledge to spread, as the reproduction of information can now take place in days rather than weeks and be accomplished by a bunch of greasy apprentices in a workshop somewhere, rather than laboriously by a monk in an abbey. Uh, as with the internet, um, the printing press was uh, used mostly by academics and enthusiasts at first and took a while to catch on more generally, though once people started to realize that you could use this newfangled printing press to make money and weaken your religious and political opponents, uh, often at the same time, it gained a lot more popularity. Uh, 
the printing press, uh, the story goes, uh, democratized information, uh, making it available for the first time to the masses. Though the truth is that it, it was much more limited to that. The people who were actually capable of reading and making use of the press were still a small minority of the population, but they were often clergy, uh, less wealthy, and served smaller communities. And so this information then spread to the rest of the population at large. However, what happened next was almost certainly not what Gutenberg had in mind when he set that movable type into his press and started churning out Bibles. Um, if you had told any of the early adopters of this technology that the device they were using was going to be responsible for upending the entire social order of Europe and plunging the continent into decades of bloody religious conflict, they would have smashed the thing with a crowbar and gone back to copying everything by hand. The truth is that the march of civilization is, is uh, very rarely as simple as all that, and though sitting astride our historical mountaintop, it can uh, look like a, a neat and tidy advance of uh, reason and liberalization, democracy and progress, that that progress uh, was very dearly bought and born out of a, a crucible of violence and bloodshed. Uh, here's another memorizable fact for you. Uh, 1517, the year of the very first viral post. <laughs> I'm talking, of course, about Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which sparked the Reformation and split Western Christendom in two. Uh, Luther's 95 Theses and subsequent writings uh, spread through uh, the continent like wildfire, uh, lacking any sort of legal or regulatory framework for dealing with the innovation of the printing press. Uh, the ruling classes of this era were entirely unprepared for how quickly blasphemous and eventually seditious ideas could spread. Uh, this combined with the fact that a printer could see a handsome return on their investment by, turning it, by reproducing uh, cheap and popular pamphlets written by the controversial and prolific Martin Luther meant that uh, the authorities of the 16th and 17th century were powerless to stop the spread of the Reformation. Generally, history frames this as a positive event, uh, a chance for the common people to be closer to their faith and a rejection of the excesses of the Roman Catholic Church, like the selling of indulgences. Uh, more books were printed in the vernacular rather than Latin, allowing for people to hear directly the word of God. And as a result, literacy would explode, public schools would be established, and uh, reason and learning would flourish throughout Europe. Sounds pretty great, right? But if you were living through it, I guarantee you that you probably did not find the Reformation to be all that pleasant. <laughs> The triumph of knowledge and the growth of literacy and numeracy was probably of little interest or consolation to a Württembergian peasant dealing with decades of rampaging mercenaries or a, a French Huguenot exiled from their home. The wars of religion that followed Luther's trolling lasted 150 years by some accounts and resulted in the deaths of millions of people, including up to a third of the population of uh, the Holy Roman Empire during the Thirty Years' War. Indeed, rather than looking at the, the spread of knowledge and the free exchange of ideas as a, a glorious herald of a, a new order to come and an essential part of a freer and more rational world, many of the elites of this era were deeply distrustful uh, and feared the printing press uh, and saw it as a real and deadly threat to their interests. Uh, uninter unable to see or uninterested in the liberating potential of the press, uh, people like William Berkeley were... Uh, extremely concerned about what the common folk might do if they came into possession of a little bit of knowledge. Both Protestants and Catholics were opposed to the unsupervised lay reading of scripture, and Martin Luther himself was not opposed to the banning or even burning of books, as he famously did with volumes of canon law, and is seen here doing with a papal bull that he didn't much care for. That isn't to say, though, that the powerful of this era uh, didn't recognize the potential of this tool and try to bend it to their own whims. In fact, one of the first uses of the word propaganda comes from a commission of cardinals called De Propaganda Fide, or the Propagation of Faith, uh, established by Pope Gregory XIII to combat the uh, fake news of the Reformation. <laughs> By the middle of the 17th century, uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation were engaged in a fierce war of ideas waged with printed materials, with competing theologies, lies, slander, misinformation, and wild accusations of heresy, all competing for the increasingly limited attention spans of the beleaguered population. 
It can seem like the moment that we're living in has no precedent, that the threat caused by the misuse and corruption of social media is a uniquely terrifying threat. And in a sense, that's true. Uh, the social media and the internet are, uh, are unprecedented and have had and will continue to have effects beyond our ability to fully predict or comprehend. But the core issues that we're struggling with, the problems that we need to solve, uh, have very little, if anything, to do with the technology themselves and everything to do with how human beings are making use of it. Recently at Davos, uh, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg made very much the same point that I'm making, dismissing fears of Facebook's growing power and influence by saying that people were also afraid of the printing press, which is true. I've been making that exact same point now for about 12 minutes. But if you can believe this, I don't think that Sandberg is employing this analogy with the best of intentions. And while broadly, yes, that's true, there are serious categorical errors in comparing Facebook itself to the printing press, which is a bit more like if there were a single press in all of Europe and it meticulously recorded everything that everybody read. I'm a historian, I'm not an oracle. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, and anybody who tells you otherwise is a liar or selling something. But I can tell you that though we are facing a uniquely uh, uncertain future and that factors like AI and algorithms and high-tech surveillance complicate our relationships to these technologies in ways that are very difficult to anticipate or quantify, that the issues that we need to solve, the problems that we need to overcome are problems that we created. Uh, Facebook didn't sell your private data on its own. Twitter didn't inflame toxic culture wars all by itself. People did that. Social media, much like the printing press, um, has had an impact um, beyond our ability to anticipate or comprehend. Uh, just as the printing press made possible the growth of uh, eventually, after all of the, the violence of bloodshed was over, the printing press did make possible a huge growth in knowledge and reason and learning and made possible uh, a burst of exploration in literature, the humanities and science, and eventually the overthrow of the divine right of kings and the establishment of democracy around the globe. And so too has social media, though it is still very much in its infancy, made possible the Arab Spring, uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and other social movements. And though it is uncontroversial that social media is contributing to our general unhappiness, uh, it remains to be seen whether or not that has anything to do with the technology itself or if it's consequence of what it now allows us to see and comprehend. Social media has been badly misused by the powerful to uh, manipulate and to distort, but it can just as easily be used to educate, to liberate, to connect, to build power among the powerless. So, by all means, log off more often, uh, set your phone to do not disturb, and be more intentional about how you engage on social media. But the people who would use this technology to increase their wealth and power and influence to control and manipulate aren't going to stop using it because it has negative mental health outcomes or is contributing to political instability. And even though I imagine many of us would like to go back to a time before their was this constant drain on our attention and our happiness. Um, the number of people connected to the internet last year passed four billion. That's half the world's population. There is no putting this toothpaste back in the tube. This technology is already out there and it is up to us to decide what to do with it. So moving forward, let's look at this technology as what it is and recognize the power of these tools. Let's not give up on these powerful mechanisms that have been handed to us. Let's use them to work together and to build a better world. Thank you.